Is a train a train without a choo-choo? Of course not. Hence why we must discuss it. Though the sounds of train horns are varied across the country, they are very important for safety and for pleasing us railroad enthusiasts. The science, the manufacturing, the music of the railroad, and much more on this episode of Train Talk. To my fellow viewers, and welcome once again to the second episode of Train Talk. We will talk all things train and put knowledge in our brain. By viewer democracy, today's discussion will be on train horns, the things that often scare and entrance people the most about the railroad. For the past week and a half, I have journeyed across the internet, researching the engineering and the diversity of all things train horn, and compiling the sum of my discoveries into this video for your viewing pleasure, losing not only my sleep, but my personal information in the process. Yes, Horn Blasters was a very valuable source of my information, and evidently my data was very valuable to them as well, because ever since a few days ago, oh I've been getting ads for them on my Instagram feed. The internet is a scary place, man. Anyways, let's start off this discussion talking about the why. Why do trains have horns? Well, simply put, it's because people are goofy. Trains going through cities, residential areas, and even just railroad facilities inevitably have to do with people. And people, in case you haven't found out yet, are fools. Cars running the gates, families taking photos, red fans looking for that perfect shot, the homeless, you name it. There are plenty of people who get too close to the tracks every day. Shoot, I'll admit that there are some shots that I've taken that were way too close, but as we've already established before, I'm not a normie so we're chilling. In all seriousness though, horns are a way to alert the surrounding environment that a train is either about to move or is approaching. When a train is stopped and about to move, a train blows its horn. When a train is running through a road crossing, granted it's not a quiet zone, it blows its horn. If an engineer sees someone close to the tracks, whether they should be there or they shouldn't be, a train blows its horn. And these horns are loud. At least they're supposed to be. If you're dealing with an ACC, it's really a hit or miss. Another important reason that trains have horns is due to the nature of the acoustics of a train. You may not even think about this considering how loud trains are, but when a train is moving, almost all the sound that it's producing goes out to the sides. The majority of the sound is not being projected in front of or behind of the train, which is a problem if you're having a train approaching an area where there could be people and there could be a safety hazard. This is why you can have a train practically in front of you and still basically not hear anything until it's right in front of you. So because the horn is so loud and it is literally directed to blast in front and behind the locomotive, a train horn provides a much better way to alert the surrounding environments of a train's arrival compared to waiting for the train to just show up at your doorstep. These horns need to be loud because trains are dangerous. Like I think especially some of us that see trains often lose sight of the size, the strength, and the power that's in a locomotive. Peep this AC44 C6M moving at let's say 50 miles per hour and weighing at about 216 tons. Let's exclude the other two locomotives that are also behind it that also weigh over 200 tons in addition to the hundreds of tons of freight that these three locomotives are hauling. This single lead AC44 hitting you at the speed mentioned before has the equivalent energy of getting hit by a 4.5 pound brick at just under 15,500 miles per hour. Yes, 15,500 miles per hour. Could you imagine, my brothers and sisters watching this, a brick at that speed getting launched at your head? That same threat is coming towards you when the train is moving. And these things take a mile to stop, so they're not waiting for you until it's too late. Unfortunately, people don't recognize this. And because crews would rather not hit a poor soul, you have the horn to alert all those around 
there's a train coming, please stay off the tracks. Anyways, let's move past that negativity and instead start looking at the horn themselves. A train horn is, believe it or not, usually three to five smaller horns called bells or chimes that are put together. These bells sit together on what's called the manifold, and each of these bells put together and blown simultaneously sound the train horn that you're used to hearing. Perhaps you're wondering, Loco, why is a train horn really five horns? Well, trains used to only have one or two time horns, but these sounded, one, in my opinion, very ugly, and two, very similar to cars and other roadway motor vehicles. Take for instance the A200, a single chime horn that would have been used in the early days of diesel locomotives that legit sounds like a truck. Whereas a whistle on a steam locomotive would have sounded very distinctive, a train horn would have just sounded like a very loud bus or something like that. And so since people were hearing these horns, expecting trucks, and then getting hit by trains, adding more chimes than what you would encounter on the roads allowed roads to sound separate from other vehicles and increase safety. With each chime, we have the power chamber this little capped area behind the horn, and inside the power chamber is the diaphragm. When air is passed into the power chamber, it passes past the diaphragm and causes it to vibrate. This vibration occurs at a certain frequency and produces sound waves, and the shape of the chime, especially its length, serves to modify and amplify the sound you hear, hence giving us the train horns that we know and love. The longer the chime, the lower the pitch, the shorter the chime, the higher the pitch. This makes trains musical in a way, if you ignore the deafening sound of wheels clacking and squealing, because the frequency each of these chimes blows can actually be mapped to a musical note, which you'll see soon. Similar to how train locomotives are primarily produced by General Electric and Electromotive Diesel, train horns you'll find today are almost all produced by two main companies, Leslie Super Typhon and Nathan Airchime, especially Nathan Airchime. Leslie horns are not the standard these days, they were in a long forgotten age of railroading. If you see a Leslie horn now, which we'll discuss later, it's almost certainly on an older locomotive. No modern units that I'm aware of today are manufactured with Leslie horns mounted. Once you get used to hearing these horns, you'll be able to identify them, but if you had no information at all about horns, the manufacturer name is inscribed on the horn itself, whether it says Leslie or Airtime. Leslie and Nathan each have their own series of horns and use a specific set of bells designed to resonate a specific note. These bells are usually designated with a number and can be mixed or reversed in any manner to produce the desired sound, which we'll get into as we dive deeper. Now that we've gotten past all the boring stuff, let's get to what you came here for, the horns. Let's start off with the Leslie horns, because there's so few of them and there's really only three you'll hear today. Specifically, we'll be looking at the Leslie RS series of horns, because the chance of you finding anything like an A200 at side of a museum is pretty slim. The RS series uses these six bells combined in various ways to produce three main horns that we'll be looking at. This chart shows the individual bells, the frequency, and the musical note accompanied with them. If we look at the label, you'll see S followed by a two digit number. The S indicates Super Typhon, while the number actually denotes the approximate frequency measured in hertz that a given chime blows at. So for example, the S25 is a Super Typhon bell that blows at about 250 hertz. Denoted on the far column marks the literal music note that this frequency produces. The subscript, or little number you see next to the note, indicates the octave of the note. Without getting too much into musical theory, basically you can have the same note but in a different octave, and the higher octave means a higher pitch sound. So if you had an A4 and an A5 for example, these notes would essentially sound the same but A5 would sound higher pitch than A4. Back to the series of horns. The R indicates an updated power chamber. Prior to every RS horn, there was just the S. So for example, before the RS3L, there was just the S3L. 
This R power chamber is a single part instead of a two component assembly that you would have seen on the S version of the horn. This updated R chamber was produced as a result of the original chamber being prone to failure when contaminants got inside the horn, which is inevitable to happen on the railroad and are identifiable by the spike back caps they have behind the bells. Speaking of RS3 elves, let's start off their discussion with Leslie by looking at this horn, which used to be very common across GE and EMB locomotives on different railroads. This is a spike back chamber, super typhlon, three chime horn that's used to play the L chord, and it specifically uses bells 25, 31, and 44. We have the RS3K, which was popular on old Burlington Northern EMDs. These are three chimed Super Typhoon horns tuned to the K chord using bells 31, 37, and 48. Last and absolutely not least, we have the RS5T, a five chime super typhon horn tuned to the T chord and using bells 25, 31, 37, 44, and 55. I really wasn't joking when I said there's only three horns you'll be hearing from Leslie nowadays. And since there's a very slim chance of hearing them unless you're on a go to short line, some blessed local service, or a museum, our discussion with Leslie will end here as we go to the main supplier of modern train horns, Nathan Airtime. Nathan, the king, supplies 90% of the horns in North America according to their website. Basically every train horn you'll hear out on the rails today is from Nathan. Nathan is simply Nathan. Like, dog, I really can't say anything else.
Anyways, almost all Nathan horns out there have their designations starting with the letter P or K. Let's start off with the P series, the older of the two lines of horns I just mentioned. Now, I cannot find an official definition of what the P means, and y'all, you, you really don't know how long I spent looking. The best I could find, however, is that all P horns have either pat pending or pat penned inscribed on the side of the bell. So I'm assuming it has something to do with that. The P horns were actually upgrades to the Nathan M horns. The M horns were higher maintenance because the bells and the manifold were essentially one piece, while the P horns could have bells removed and rearranged. If we look at this chart, we can see six main bells that were used in the P series. You'll notice that the labels for the bells don't really give information about the frequency like they did in Leslie. Instead, they're just labeled 0 through 5 in terms of ascending frequency. So the 0 bell has the lowest pitch, and the 5 bell has the highest pitch. Additionally, a special 4 bell that plays the note A sharp 4 instead of A4 was bought by Amtrak, hence making the 4A, A for Amtrak. You'll notice that our chart here looks a lot more complex than before because of this difference in old cast versus new cast. According to my sources and a few online forums I found, Around 1976 or 77, Nathan's supremacy was observed by air horn consumers across the country. Demand was very high, so Nathan Airtime subcontracted the production of P-Series bells, and these new cast P-Series bells were not produced to the exact specifications of the old cast bells, and as a result there was a slight modification to their sound. The 0 and 4A bells were not changed, I guess for whatever reason they were still made as original. The 4 bell, while still being changed in its casting process, still produced the same note. Every other bell, however, was changed and produced a slightly different note. These new notes actually ended up becoming standard, and the old cast horns of old fell behind the limelight of the new cast horns, purchased by companies like Norfolk Southern for years to come. This introduction of new cast horns also led to the creation of mixed cast B horns, horns that have, as their name suggests, a mixture of new cast and old cast chimes. There are really only two horns you'll likely encounter these days from the Nathan P series. The first is the Nathan P3 horn, the P representing is from the P series, and the three representing three chimes, specifically chimes one, two, and four. Then we have the Nathan P5, a P series horn with five chimes, which is usually bells one, two, three, four, and five. These may sound different depending on the locomotive because, like I said, there are P5s that have a mixture of old and new cast bells. An extended notation of this configuration is P135R24, which means that the bells two and four are reversed. 
Bells are usually reversed to give a more surround warning instead of just projecting the horn sound in one direction. Another variation you can come across is the P5A, which has the 4A bell instead of the 4 bell. I mean, you probably will not come across the P01235 or the P01345, which replace the four and two bells respectively with the zero bell. The chance of you seeing that is pretty slim, but it's out there for your wonderful knowledge. And that is all the time we'll spend covering the Nathan P series. Now it is time to cover the most diverse and popular line of horns on the railroad today, the Nathan K series. I'm not joking when I say this is the most diverse. I mean, look, we have 10 different bells here for crying out loud. One of my sources said the K stands for the Kettle Drum Principle, 
I didn't find this anywhere else, so I'm just gonna call it the K-Series. Take that information as you will. Although there are technically two, three, four, and five chime arrangements out on the river, you'll likely only hear the three and five chime arrangements. Let's start off with the three chime series, known as the K3. The K3 includes the K3H slash K3L, the K3HA slash K3LA, and the K3HL. The K3H slash K3L really sound the same. The difference in the H and L references the manifold design and the arrangement of the bells. The H indicates a high manifold, which means the bells are elevated higher from the locomotive body, or they're stacked on top of each other, while the L indicates a low manifold, where all the bells are lying flat closer to the engine body. This has nothing to do with the tuning of the bells or anything like that, hence why I organized them together. Here's where we'll take a quick little detour to talk about wide font, narrow font, and raised letter horns. So in the 1980s production of Nathan K. Chimes, the back cap was labeled 30109 with a wide font. These bells were characterized by playing notes flatter than what they were designed to, but still sounding very sharp. Narrow fonts came on the scene in 1989 with the back caps of Nathan K. Chimes labeled with 30109. Narrow fonts, for the most part, sounded just like wide fonts, but sounded harsher over time. I'm going to be completely honest, I'm reading directly from the source, and it says harsher, and I have literally no idea what it's suggesting here. Finally, after Nathan Airchime was purchased by Micro Precision, no one says Micro Precision horns, so don't, please don't go around saying that. We got to the modern raised letter chimes of the mid-2000s, the standard now. The sides of raised letter chimes were marked with air chimes in all caps, and were designed to play the actual intended notes that a given bell was expected to sound. We can ignore wide font horns, but remember narrow font and raised letter. The three chimes used on the K3H and the K3L are the 1, 2, and 3 bells. This is predominantly a Canadian horn, but you can still find it on some Western Railway locomotives like on Union Pacific or BNSF.
eighth introduction, the three A and four A bells were introduced. The sources I found said the A in this case meant American tuning instead of Amtrak like it did in the P-Horn series, but regardless, we have the modified three and four bells. This gives us the K3LA and K3HA, which use bells one, two, and four A. The K represents the K series, the three represents the three chimes, the L slash H represents the design of the manifold, and the A indicates the presence of an American tuned bell, in this case, the 4A. Some locomotives sport the uncommon K3H which uses bells 1, 2, and 1L. As far as I've seen, these are most common on Union Pacific, specifically on their AC4460CW rebuilds, and they've been used as replacements for K3H horns that do not comply with government decibel requirements.
some other even rarer K3 horns, such as the K3 LB and P, but these are so rare, we're not gonna bother. Let's instead go into the series of horn that will most certainly take up the most of our time, the Nathan K5 series, which consists of, of all of these wonderful horns for us to dive into. Similar to how we had the K3H and the K3L, we have the K5H and K5L that were also primarily Canadian horns. The ID means all the same things it has in the past. A K-series horn with five bells, in this case bells 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and either a high or a low manifold. back into talking about American tune horns with discussing the K5LA. This is one of the most common horns you see, especially on the eastern side of the United States. K5LAs are all over CSX, Norfolk Southern, Amtrak, and many other roads. The five chimes used in the K5LA are the 1, 2, 3A, 4A, and 5, hence the A in the designation, and the L indicates a low manifold. K5HAs technically could exist, but they really don't anywhere you'll be seeing trains. The two main configurations of K5LAs you'll see are the K5LA R23, which has its 2 and 3A bells reverse. And the K5LA R24, which has its two and four A bells reverse. These two horns are respectively known as the raised letter and the narrow font K5LA horn, which seems off initially since simply reversing the bells does not make a horn narrow font or raised letter. Since, however, the K5LA R24 is the older of the two variations, I believe this labeling is because while Nathan still made Marathon horns, they were all R24s, then by the time they switched to raised letter, all their horns were R23s. I did not find any official documentation of this, but just based on the research I've done so far and the trends we've looked at, this seems like a very plausible explanation. K5LAs are high key difficult to describe because they can literally sound so weird and varied. Literally, if a horn does not sound like something I already know of, I immediately assume it's a K5LA. That's a horrible way to go about it, but if the system works, don't break it.
continuing on with our K5 series, we have the one, the only, Nathan Airchime K5 LLA. This is a five chime K series horn with the bells 1L, 1, 2, 3A, and 4A. Hence, one of our L's represents that the 1L bell is present, and the other L represents a low manifold, and the A represents the American tune bells, 3A and 4A. The most common configuration of this horn is the K5LLA R1L, which has all the bells facing forward except for the 1L bell being reversed. Before we go on with talking about this horn, we must look at that first bell in the list, the 1L. I cannot find a definition for the L, but it appears to suggest lower because both the 1L and 3L bells in our earlier table resonate at lower pitches than just the 1 and 3L. I've highlighted this bell specifically because its production has changed over time and that complicates things with this horn. The 1L bell used to be a two-piece casting in early production, but at some point the switch was made to just a one-piece casting. This is important because both the one-piece and two-piece casting were used while the K5 LLAs were still produced with Nerophon bells, giving us not only the Nerophont and raised letter K5 LLA, but now also three generations of K5 LLAs. The first generation is a Nerophont K5 LLA with a two-piece 1L. The second generation is a Nerophont horn with a one-piece 1L. And the third generation is a raised letter K5 LLA with a one-piece 1L one since these were similarly made after the ship from two-piece. That was a lot of info, so let's just listen to some of these horns so you know how they sound. Certainly not least, we have the Nathan K5HL.
this modern age of railroading, no horn comes close to how widespread and popular the K5HL is. In North America, every class one railroad has too many of these units with K5HLs because these are the horn of the Jeeva. And we've already established in the previous train talk that Jeevas are practically inescapable. Our K5HLs here follow the same naming convention as the other horns we've looked at. A K-series 5 chime horn with the bells 1L, 1, 2, 3, and 4. A high manifold, which you can tell by the fact that the bells are stacked on top of each other instead of being laid out flat next to each other like they would on a K5 elevator. And with the L indicating the presence of an L bell. And speaking of L bells, if you guessed that the 1L would give the K5HL generations like the K5LLA did, you would be correct. We have the first generation, second generation, and third generation K5HL, which follows the same pattern we saw before. First generation is a narrow front horn with a two-piece 1L. Second generation is a narrow front with a one-piece 1L. And the third generation is a raised letter, which we assume to have a one-piece 1L.
There's also the K5HLA and the K5HLB, which have the three bells swapped out with the 3A and 3B horn respectively. These horns are examples of hybrids, horns that for whatever reason have one of their bells swapped out with something else. I will usually avoid going into hybrids because then we just get into a rabbit hole of the thousands of different ways horn bells can be switched around, but since these horns are on some heritage unions, I thought I'd make an exception. that i'm done covering new horns yay similar to the last episode this does not cover every horn you'll hear for one there's a chance you'll see a horn that looks like what we've discussed that simply sounds off this is because horns due to a number of reasons get fouled fouling refers to when a horn is damaged or does not blow as intended on the locomotive it can occur due to contamination wear and tear or potentially the locomotive that a given horn is mounted on SD70ACCs, for example, had very beautiful P5As when they first came out, and they literally all went foul. Like it wasn't even funny how every single ACC with a P5A sounded like a flute after a few months. So much so that they literally had to change the horns because they were starting to get so quiet you couldn't hear them, making them a safety hazard. Additionally, I simply do not cover everyone out there because one, some are just too old for you to see on the main line, like the Nathan M horns, and two, there are too many permutations of horns that you can make with all the different bells out there. For instance, this sonic bonnet here has a K5 LLE. Like, you're not seeing this anywhere else, I'm sorry. <laughs> This SD70 Ace has a K5LL. This SD40-2 has what appears to be a K4LA because I saw it in Gainesville and I only saw four chimes on top. These among others are horns that are so uncommon and hard to find that I've decided not to find a reason to research them. Everything I discuss here, however, is a pretty solid description of the horns you see at Railfin and the High Iron, and I truly hope that this video helps. I definitely learned a lot, even just researching it, and I hope I can pass that learning on to you. I put a link to all my sources in the bottom. Special thanks to Tommy BNSF, reading your descriptions came up clutch. As always, God bless. I'll see you soon. Out.